Thank you so much, Brian. That was pretty. <laughs> Probably turn that down just a tad. Woo! Goodness, you guys don't need to hear me that loud. Loudly, rather. Is there gain on this? No. Good? <clears throat> well, good morning. How's it going? Everyone looks great. That I can see. It's kind of dark, to be honest. I decided to dress in my Florida-esque style to commemorate where I'm from, um, mostly because the shirt I tried on this morning no longer fits me anymore. So I had to go with something else. Um, in fiction, w whether it be literary or, or film-based, or maybe stories you heard growing up, uh, many times the protagonist, the main character, is, is an ordinary Jane or Joe. They, they live their lives being you know, like a farmer or you know, a fisherman or maybe even someone in the lowest class of society. You know, one day, a, a tinker comes along and sells them some magic beans. Or, or a, you know, an old wise storyteller comes through and tells them a tale that starts remarkably similar to their own. And soon, this ordinary Joe is whisked off on a quest to find his lady love or to slay the menacing dragon or to usurp power from the evil king. Throughout these adventures, the protagonist may face different tests and trials. Things that test their abilities, test their devotion to the cause, test who they are as people, and, and it shows them whether or not their damsel in distress is, is worth all this distress that they're enduring. Oftentimes, their faith gets shaken. It, they've endured so much that they maybe look to turn back. And it's at that time that the, the tinker comes back or the storyteller returns or this person has a vividly lucid dream that tells them that they are the only ones who can do it. They are fulfilling their destiny. Maybe their grandfather is the evil king. Uh, only they can wield the sword to slay the dragon or the damsel is destined to be their true love. This hero is the only one who can fulfill this task, else it would be just a task never completed, a failed mission, a journey without an end. Eventually, the hero musters up enough courage to face the villain, to confront this danger, and to fight, and to come out victorious in the end. Eventually, the hero fulfills their task, fulfills what they had set out to do. Now, in, in 2 Timothy 4, Paul charges Timothy to fulfill his ministry, to proclaim the message, to stay true, and to ultimately finish the race. And we, as Christians, like the hero in these stories, can take heart from this charge to fulfill our ministry. Not only can we find a challenge to strive to fulfill what we've been baptized into, proclaiming the message and staying true, but Paul also illustrates the joy and the elation of finishing the race and receiving the crown of righteousness. So how do we fulfill our ministry? What does it look like when we fulfill what we are supposed to do and what we are supposed to constantly devote our lives to? In 2 Timothy, Paul gives us a look and some insight on what it looks like to fulfill our ministries. The first way we fulfill our ministry is by proclaiming the message. Um, 2 Timothy 4, I'm going to give you guys just a second you got your Bible's phones out. Go ahead and open that up real quick. Um, I'm cheating a little bit. I have it literally in my manuscript. So I'll give you guys just a second to... 2 Timothy 4, and we'll start in verse 1. So, uh, 2 Timothy 4. Now, this is towards the end of the second letter to Timothy written by Paul. Um, Timothy, as you know was a very young man who was, um, how, how can you say this, sold out for Christ. Um, uniquely so, based on other young men his age. Um, so 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 2 says, I solemnly charge you, 
before God and before and Christ Jesus, who is going to judge the living and the dead, and because of his appearing and his kingdom. Proclaim the message. Persist in it whether convenient or not. Rebuke, correct, and encourage with great patience and teaching. So the first part of fulfilling our ministry is proclaiming the message, whether it is convenient or not. Whether we're in a position where we are uncomfortable, whether we believe it will be well received, or whether we might be ridiculed or mocked for it. Proclaim the message, it doesn't matter whether or not it's easy. Because I, I firmly believe there are occasions where it is easy, right? I, I'm kind of in one right now. You guys have all kind of unanimously agreed to sit here for the next 20 or so minutes and listen to me talk about scripture. In Sunday school, we have a group of people who are, who are ready and willing to listen. At conferences, you know, in Bible studies, th those are the places where it's easy and it's good to proclaim the message and to teach others and to learn. But there are places that it isn't easy to proclaim the message, right? What about the, the foreign area in Honduras and Central America like Tyson spoke to us about last week? What about the center of Africa in the country of Malawi like our missionaries Larry and Mandy? What about on the side of the road on Chapman Highway in a rough part of South Knoxville on a hot May day like the middle-aged guy I saw the other day? Proclaim the message wherever you're at. Does it mean you have to go to another country or, or stand out getting a sunburn? What it does mean is that we're burdened with the knowledge, the knowledge of Christ, that, that if other people don't have this knowledge, that they're lost and without a Savior. Now, proclaiming the message is so important. Jesus said it in his last command, in the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 18 through 20 says, Then Jesus came near and said to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. It's not... It's not a command we can afford to forget. It's not a command we, we can just gloss by when we read scripture. We must proclaim the message. Now, proclaiming the message involves a couple different things. Paul states that we must rebuke, correct, and encourage with great patience and teaching. So, when speaking to people about Christ, whether they're new believers or unbelievers, assuring that they have the right ideas when it comes to scripture and theology is crucial, telling them when they are or aren't on the right track. Rebuking and, and subsequently correcting them in certain cases is what Paul tells us to do. Now, now oftentimes, I'll, I'll, see, I'll see this, and I think some of you guys can relate. I'll see people who are real keen on rebuking. Ooh, they love it. <laughs> The moment someone says something wrong, the moment someone says, whether it be an atheist or agnostic or someone of different religion or someone who is not in the same denomination or doesn't have the same ideas on things, they're real keen on rebuking. There are a couple, couple, a uh, few gentlemen in downtown Knoxville um, who, who like the term children of Beelzebub to call everyone as they're walking by. Um, they love rebuking. But... But sometimes I, I see them rebuking and I'm, I'm thinking they're forgetting the rest of that part. <laughs> they're forgetting to correct. They forget to encourage with great patience and teaching. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 through 11 says, For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up as you are already doing. Now, we can forget this, right? When we see someone post something on social media we don't like, 
right? It's easy to, it's easy to rebuke. I've done it. I've felt bad about it and apologized. Um, or, or maybe when your friends or family or people you've been witnessing to are, aren't getting the gospel. They're just not getting it. They don't understand. But, but this first part of fulfilling our ministry involves proclaiming the message by rebuking, correcting, and encouraging with great patience and teaching. Now, the second way in, in Timothy, so we'll, we'll be back in Timothy, uh, 2 Timothy 4. Um, the second way to fulfill our ministry is by staying true. 2 Timothy 4, 3 through 5 says, For the time will come when they will not tolerate sound doctrine, but according to their own desires will multiply teachers for themselves because they have an itch to hear something new. They will turn away from hearing the truth and will turn aside to myths. But as for you, be serious about everything, endure hardship, and do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Webster's defines being true or true as being in accordance with the actual state of affairs, conformable to an essential reality, fully realized or fulfilled. Another definition is for true is being that which is the case rather than what is manifest or assumed. So this part of fulfilling your ministry is staying true. Staying true involves holding to the teachings of scripture and not turning aside to myths, false teaching, or legends, following that which is the case rather than that which is manifest or assumed. Because we're in a time where sometimes people don't want to tolerate sound doctrine. They, they let go or purposefully forget that part of fulfilling their ministry. They lose their trueness. And Paul and Timothy were also in a time in which people did not wish to tolerate, tolerate sound doctrine. Because he, he says there will come a time when people won't tolerate it. Simply in Paul and Timothy's time alone, there were numerous others who claimed to be a chosen one, who claimed to be a Messiah or a super, someone of supernatural importance. In Acts 5, um, the Pharisees were enraged over the apostles. They, were, they had brought them before the Sanhedrin, and they were accusing them of um, crucifying the Messiah. Gamaliel, does anyone know who Gamaliel is? Raise your hand. Liz does, of course. <laughs> Gamaliel was uh, Paul's Hebraic teacher, actually. Um, he was a teacher of the law, um, very well respected. Um, Acts 5, 33 through 39 says, When they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. A Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law who was respected by all people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered the men to be taken outside for a little while. He said to them, Men of Israel, be careful what you're going to do to these men. Not long ago, Theodos rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a group of about 400 men rallied to his cause, to him. He was killed, and all the, his partisans were dispersed, and it came to nothing. After this man, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and attracted a following. That man also perished, and his partisans were scattered. And now I tell you, stay away from these men and leave them alone. For if this plan or this work is of men, it will not be overthrown, or it will be overthrown. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You may even be found fighting against God. I, I love this verse. I love it because so often the Pharisees are painted in this terrible light we actually use the word Pharisee to signify someone who's a hypocrite. Um, they're the antagonists, you know, the bigots, the, those people who go against what they teach. So often we see them poorly that we forget they were supposed to be the well-respected teachers of their day. But this verse shows that there were some who did in fact understand Yahweh and his plans after all. The point is, is Gamaliel states that there have been other men who've claimed to be something. They turned away from the truth. They turned away from fulfilling their ministries and no doubt turned aside to their own myths and brought others with them, drawing individuals who wanted to be taught doctrine according to their own desires 
just as Paul is telling Timothy. You know, we see people like this today, too. Individuals who have abandoned sound doctrine and fallen away to either their own self-interested ideals or the, to the teachings of another. Um, to name a few, uh, the KKK, L. Ron Hubbard's Church of Scientology, Realism, uh, Jim Jones, the People's Temple, Jehovah's Witness, the Church of Latter-day Saints. Many of these groups of people are people who had an itch to hear something different and they subsequently turned away from hearing the truth. Romans 16, 17 through 18 says, Now I urge you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause dissensions and obstacles contrary to the doctrine you have learned. Avoid them, for such people do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. They deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting with smooth talk and flattering words. Paul's telling Timothy that people will live according to their own desires. And in some cases, they will simply turn to the teaching that suits them best. We're charged by Paul's teaching to fulfill our ministries by staying true. Staying true to the teachings of Christ, staying true to what Christ did for others, how he lived selflessly, how he forgave, how he loved, how he confronted sin and evil. Fulfill your ministry by staying true to these teachings. And the third way he tells him to fulfill his ministry is by finishing the race. 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8, or back there, by the way. 6, starting in verse 6, he says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time for my departure is close. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the fate faith. There is reserved for me in the future the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, and not only me, but all those who have loved his appearing. Paul finishes this portion of scripture by stating what he has done, kind of in an allegorical way, fighting the good fight and finishing the race. And and many scholars believe this was kind of being written as Paul believed he was going to be murdered. And he was giving some of his final regards. Now, being poured out is like a drink offering is, is language seen in another one of Paul's letters. I mean, Philippians 2, 16 through 7 says, Hold firmly to the message of life. Then I can boast in the day of Christ that I didn't run or labor for nothing. But even if I am poured out as a drink offering... On the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. The drink offering was kind of a special offering. Uh, You see, a burnt offering, when someone would offer a a burnt offering to God, it would leave residue on the ground. You'd have the bones and the things that didn't burn from the animal, and it would lay there for, for a long time until it began to decay. But a drink offering was different. You see, when, when they poured out a drink offering, nothing was left. All of the liquid soaked into the ground and no residue was left on the earth. Paul stating that he's given his life to Christ with no residue left. No hint of him living for anything or anyone else. But he's fought the good fight and finished the race and he shows us To fulfill our ministry, we must also fight, keep the faith, and ultimately finish the race. To me, it seems like Paul's tired. He's weary, he's worn out, and he's ready for the payoff, ready for the crown of righteousness. But but he, he gives us this hope, stating that there is a crown of righteousness to be given. Now, I grew up with a certain idea of heaven, of, of the new earth, of the crown of righteousness. And I believe we probably all did too. Um, I always thought of it as like a floaty cloud experience, uh, ethereal experience. Uh, my, de- my ideas have changed over time since I've been to Bible college and, you know, just learned more about scripture. Um, but there's a good, the, the best representation I've found of heaven or, or of the crown of righteousness um, is in the final book in the Chronicles of Narnia by C.S. Lewis. Um, most of you probably know him. He was uh, an author, a Christian apologist, and a philosopher. 
Um, in the last book, in the last paragraph of that series, the, the book's called The Last Battle. Lewis gives not a direct description, but, but kind of how it feels, and, and I think that this is phenomenal. Lewis says in the final, in the final chapter, <clears throat> And as he spoke, he no longer looked to them like a lion, but the things that began to happen after that were so great and beautiful that I cannot write them. And for us, this is the end of all the stories, and we can most truly say that they all lived happily ever after. But for them, it was only the beginning of the real story. All their lives in this world and all their adventures in Narnia had only been the cover and the title page. Now, the, now at last they were beginning chapter one of the great story, which no one on earth has ever read, which goes on forever, in which every chapter is better than the one before. Now, to fulfill our ministry, Paul tells us that we must proclaim the gospel, we must stay true, and that we must also finish the race. He shows us that it won't be easy to finish the race, it, far from it. We need to pour ourselves out like drink offerings, giving anything and everything we have to Christ, leaving no residue. We need to fight the good fight, working past difficulties, even when seem, things seem hopeless or when things seem lost. And we need to keep our faith, even through the valleys of shadow and death, even when we, we begin to question or doubt God. We need to keep our faith and we need to finish the race. To cross the finish line with arms wide open. To finish, to wait, to live the great story in which every chapter is better than the last. I know it may not be easy, but we all know it's so worth it. Now, many of you here are married. Many of you have been married probably longer than I've been alive. Some, some of you probably twice over. Um, and a lot of you know, I, you know, I'm not married. Um, but, but I, I, you know, I, my parents have been married for 30 plus years. I know numerous married people. Um, there, there are a few aspects that I've seen to marriage. Um, one is, is simply the fact that other knows you are, others know you are married. Um, you, you, you vow to be with them in front of people, a judge or a priest or, or a minister. Um, you wear a ring to kind of broadcast that you are married, and other people generally know that you are married. You, you proclaim to others, whether or not be literally, that you are married. Another aspect is staying true to that person. You vow to remem remain faithful to them, holding to the promises that you made at your marriage ceremony, not sharing an intimacy with anyone but them. And ultimately, you vow to do this until the day you die through sickness and in health, till death do you part, you vow to finish the race with them, regardless of the obstacles you face. Fulfilling our ministry is kind of like this. Sharing our faith, faith with others, proclaiming the gospel, whether it be with our mouths or our actions, staying true to God's word, even in a world that wants to misconstrue scripture and sound teaching and ultimately finishing the race, fighting the good fight, and keeping the faith even through the difficult times. Be like the hero in the fantasy story. Finish the race and live the great story where every chapter is better than the last. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the opportunities that you've given to me, given to us, to uh, to be able to preach the word, to be able to listen to the word, to be able to learn. I pray that as we go about our lives this week, that we remember what Paul says to Timothy, that we take heart from it. That we proclaim the gospel, we proclaim the message with our lives, with our actions, with our words. That we stay true to what you've taught us and what is in scripture. And that we keep that finish line in sight knowing that it's there, knowing there awaits a crown of righteousness for us. Thank you so much, Lord, in your name.